In a previous video, I focused on promising locations and Sasquatch researchers that we've covered on Bigfoot Beyond the Trail. So as a follow-up of sorts, this video will focus on possible encounters and evidence we've had happen to us. Before we continue on, here's a brief word from a sponsor who helps make videos like this possible. The world nowadays seems as crazy as ever, and with economic uncertainty at the forefront of many people's problems, it can be hard to stay caught up with bills, let alone think about planning that Sasquatch research trip into the mountains this summer. Unexpected expenses add stress and cancel plans as well. There is a way to tackle those expenses, however. Dave is a banking app that could help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. With Dave, there's no interest, late fees, or credit check. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief they need. Download Dave today at dave.com monsters. That's dave.com monsters. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve, member FDIC. Keep in mind, none of this is conclusive evidence of the existence of Sasquatch. Nobody has that definitive proof quite yet. Otherwise, we'd likely be having an entirely different conversation. This video serves to showcase some interesting things we've come across throughout Bigfoot Beyond the Trail over the last two years since we started it. This can also serve as an introduction to some of our newer viewers about our previous expeditions and endeavors featured in other Bigfoot Beyond the Trail videos. A couple of these incidents have been featured in a previous audio analysis video from this past November in which we discussed possible theories about alleged Sasquatch audio and some excellent analysis from researcher Chris Spencer whose information will be linked below, as he's a great resource when it comes to level-headed audio analysis about this topic. To reiterate, this is all speculative in nature. While I cannot say any of these incidents or potential evidence we are about to showcase is 100% proof of Sasquatch with certainty, some of it does seem to fit the possible theorized behavior of these creatures. Furthermore, when dealing with alleged evidence and encounters, it's important to try and first explain it as something other than a Sasquatch. Run through a list of potential candidates or factors that could give the illusion of something Sasquatch-like. Use Occam's razor and don't jump to wild conclusions without much basis. People either get very excited about an encounter or potential evidence and jump the gun, so to speak, without first analyzing what alternatives it could have been. There is also a tendency to get emotionally invested in so-called evidence. Some will often get angry or defensive when tough questions are asked. The evidence should stand on its own, and being open to dialogue about it should be normal and commonplace. Someone skeptical asking fair or even tough questions should not be seen as an attack or refutation of said evidence. I for one welcome discussion and am open to theories and suggestions for what could explain away some of these incidents. Be sure to let us know what you think in the comments below as well. With this topic, one of the overall most common pieces of evidence is anecdotal in nature. Those being the many eyewitness accounts and their alleged encounters with Sasquatches across North America. I've interviewed upwards of 70 plus eyewitnesses and researchers alike, just with Bigfoot Beyond the Trail. The sheer amount of encounters we've been told is compelling. Surely they cannot all be lying or misidentifying a known animal. Hearing about similar encounters from areas thousands of miles apart speaks to a consistency of behavior, which could indicate there is a real species responsible for that behavior. While it is true that eyewitness testimony can be unreliable and influenced by a variety of factors, 
I think those aforementioned behavioral consistencies are compelling enough to take credible eyewitness encounters seriously. Here's one of the many eyewitness interviews we've conducted, this time with a woman from Ohio. We live right smack in the middle of 97 acres here with a swamp to the west and uh, eagle's nest to the east and railroad tracks to the south. Well, when I started staying here regularly, my, my habit was to get up in the morning and make coffee and then come and sit in front of this window because I often got to see deer or foxes or swans or whatever was out there. It was just starting to get daylight and I was sitting over there looking out the window and I noticed down in the ditch that runs through the property what I thought was probably the largest deer I had ever seen. But my mind kept saying, well, it looks too dark to be a deer. Maybe it's a bear, even though at that time we weren't really hearing about bear sightings. So I stood up to grab the binoculars and when I stood up, whatever it was, also stood up and turned and I, I feel, I know it sounds so stupid, but I feel like it made eye contact. And then I reached for the binoculars again and it just turned and did this like loping, gliding, leaping run right into the corner of the woods. And I was just, I was like, nobody's ever going to believe this, you know. And I don't know what I saw. I know it wasn't a deer because deer do not stand up and run on their hind legs. And I really feel like it was too tall to be a bear. And the weird sensation that I got when I felt like it made eye contact was just unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Donna's sighting had never been recreated before, so we headed out to the field where it happened to try and get an approximate size of the creature. All right, so I was in the room directly to the left of the gray new room that's there now. I was sitting in front of that window. You can see where that kind of open place is in the field between where the soybeans are, and then there's like a dip, and then there's the soybeans. A little bit drier in there, yeah. It was right there and when it took off it went that way and I swear it only looked like it took like six leaps until it was in that corner of the woods. Wow. Was it like a kind of like it a was loaf like, or? Yeah, I can't do it but it was like a, a leap like a almost like slow motion kind of a bounding type of yes. Like that? Yes, like okay. that. Interesting. Only bigger, only yeah. like bigger. Sure. Just, because, like I said, I, I can see that it would have had to have been more than six steps. But from the house, my impression was, geez, only six steps to get to the woods, you know. And so that little dip right there where you can see kind of the, the uh, mud, that's where it was? Yes. Okay. Cool. All right, so I think what we'll do now is if you guys want to head back into that window, we'll, we'll get on the phone. I'm going to stand in that spot, and I'll try to maybe tell me how much bigger or smaller oh, cool. it was. So we'll recreate yeah. it, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, so I'm in the spot, I believe. You tell me if yeah, that looks exactly. pretty accurate to me. Okay, so you said it was crouched over. Yes. So I'm crouched over. How much bigger or smaller or bulkier than me? Um, probably one and a half times as bulky uh, lengthwise just height wise the whole you know the whole thing just one and a half times easily okay and so i'm going to stand up now you said it stood up and looked yeah it stood point. up and then pivoted towards these windows and looked right at me and then turned and bounded off so i'm going to use my hand now and you tell me how much taller you think you're okay going. hold on till i get my binoculars yeah, if I had to have put a height on it, I would have said seven, seven and a half. Seven, seven and a half, yeah, that yeah. seems about right. And half again, your body width, um, you know, the circumference all the way around. Okay. So you, like you said, the biggest deer you've ever seen. Yes, <laughs> only it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So I'm gonna and also, not, not fat, you know, just just uniformly big, not like, right. you know, 
like a big belly or anything like that, just uniformly big. Yeah. Can you tell me how fast or how much faster or slower than me it went? So I'm going to start the whole sequence. I'm actually going to put my phone in my pocket. So While you're running very fast, it didn't appear to be fast so much as it had just a really long gait. Yeah, okay. That's the best way I can describe it. Well, that was exhausting. I tried to run as fast as I could. I got caught up in the soybeans. I don't know how thick it was that time of year. She said it was probably not as, as high as it is now in the end of the summer. But I tried to run and man, that thing made it in as quick as she did. It was a lot faster than me. And I mean, I used to play soccer. I'm a pretty fast runner. So. To date, one of my favorite places I've ever hiked into is the High Uintas mountain range of Utah. In the summer of 2021, Eli and I hiked to a beautiful and remote alpine lake known as Amethyst Lake in the High Uintas. It was a 13 mile round trip hike going above the 10,000 foot elevation mark and it started out simply enough as a multi-day backpacking trek into this incredible wilderness. While getting a later start on the hike earlier in the day, it was night by the time we reached the valley where the lake was located. Wow, Whew. how you feeling dude? I'm tired. Yeah, this is definitely tough. We're, uh, we're almost there, We've got about a mile left, so. It was at this point, as we hiked on in the darkness of the forest, both tired and hungry, but singing to keep our spirits up, that we were abruptly stopped in our tracks by a loud crash in the trees close by. You hear that? Uh -huh. How loud that was? Dude. You wanna take our packs off here? Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm getting... Wow, that was freaking loud. Go lights off. That was crazy. That was really loud. Yep. Caught me off guard. your reaction it was something loud and something breaking right there yep it was uh right as we're walking yeah, I know. typical weird something strange Both times, it's happened when we've been talking or doing something. But I noticed the past two times, we had our lights off for a bit, and then we turned them on, and that's yeah. what happened. So maybe the lights off for a bit? Yeah. All right, so we originally were going to hike to the lake. It's still a bit, it's only about a mile away. But given we've had some weird stuff going on, could be anything, but I mean, it was coming from different directions. It's super silent right now. We're, we found a little clearing. We're just going to set up here for the night.
It was a relatively windless night. The audio recorder didn't pick up any wildlife, movement, or loud sounds, aside from a few stick-breaking type noises, which were nowhere near as loud as what we heard while hiking. It was mostly deathly quiet. The following morning, we investigated the area of the incident. Uh, we're going to try to recap. Basically, we're walking up the trail here, right? Were you in front of me at that point? No, I was behind. So I'm in front, walking right here, and right from that direction, I hear, you know, what sounds like a pretty loud knock. How, how would you describe it, Eli? Yeah, just a knock. So we immediately put our packs down over here, start doing some knocks against this little tree here. We're hanging out for a little bit here. We go lights off, we get the night vision. We hear something faint coming from that direction, just like a small one. At that point, the camera was rolling. A few minutes go by, we then hear two pretty loud ones come down from this way, and we have that one on audio. And I'll play it after I'm talking right now. But so it came from right down in that direction. So I'd say we just go down there and kind of see, because that's where two of those, or three, I guess, of the noises that we heard came from. So, in terms of ruling out, you know, other things, so first of all, what about wind? I don't think it was that windy that it could have done that. And it was seemingly coordinated or not coincidental. So then you're pretty much left with wildlife. There's moose in here. So, I mean, that's a possibility. Maybe moose breaking some sticks or something. I don't know. We, you can't automatically jump to. The Sasquatch conclusion, of course. Moose, elk, uh, mountain lion, I don't know if they would exactly do that. I'd probably lean towards something more uh, undulate, elk or moose, something like that, than I would a mountain lion doing something of that nature. So, tough to say. Nothing much happened the rest of our time in the valley until our final morning while out and about bushwhacking. What's so cool about this valley is if you had a few weeks or maybe a month, you could scour the whole area back and forth. You have obviously mountains on either side, so you could concentrate on this area and I'm sure you'd run into all kinds of wildlife. Probably even maybe something Sasquatch related. What's up? I think it was up on that hill. 
sounded like it was coming from down the hill, but... I mean, chances are, whatever it was, probably hurt us as we came towards it, took off. We wouldn't hurt anything because we're too busy crunching on sticks and being loud humans. That was two responses. Yep. What other animal would do that? It's not a woodpecker. We've heard him. <clears throat> Start heading back. Sure. It was an interesting time in such a stunningly beautiful location. The activity we experienced was inconclusive, but still unexpected, and we found it to be quite intriguing. While out in central Kentucky in November of 2022, I went to an area with a history of Sasquatch reports, including a location where the show Monster Quest had experienced some activity sent there by local researcher Jeff Waldridge, who routinely goes to this location solo. I emulated his style of only using red lights at night and hiked alone towards a river in the area. something. I feel like it wouldn't be that big. Yeah, I can still see it there just barely. I just don't get the feeling I'd be able to see definition on anything. Well, well this is definitely making it a lot easier being able to warm up in the car trying to find the motivation to get back out there and walk down the other trail that knock that's the only thing i could really say that was somewhat compelling i mean it was pretty interesting i was kind of hoping for some more i mean that knock sounded like it came from across and up towards the right not exactly close but not not terribly far i wouldn't say again comparing it to a gunshot distant gunshot it didn't sound like that to me. Whatever that thing was that I was filming before I got into the car to warm up is no longer there. The large heat signature I was getting on here, it almost looked double. I'm scanning the entire hill I mean, I'm not gonna say that's something, but I'm in the exact spot I was in. I almost feel like I should have kept the thermal on it and just kept it running outside. That is really weird. I just don't know how big it would be if it was that far up. I mean, I'm scanning exactly where it would have been. 
As for the thermal footage, I'm going to attempt to analyze this as best I can. The primary problem is that I wasn't able to return to this location the next day to follow up, as I was heading back home for Thanksgiving. Ideally, it would be great to return with another person in order to have them climb the hill opposite where I was parked and recreate the footage entirely, but for now we'll work with what we have. First off, obviously it's very inconclusive overall. It's basically a blob squatch, but I'm not claiming it's a Sasquatch at all. I have no clue what it is. Whatever this is, however, I do believe it was an animate object, as in an animal of some kind. While at first I believed it to be stationary, something like a rock near the top of the hill, it was clearly not there any longer after those 10 to 15 minutes later when I scanned the same area after getting out of the car. Two things I find intriguing about it are number one, my hearing of a pretty clear wood knock from that side of the river and general area while I was out there, and number two, the size of the heat signature given the distance, which I'll get into now. Without an exact measurement of distance made on location, I used Google Earth to attempt to figure out the distance. Judging by the footage, the distance between myself and roughly where the subject would have been was around 1100 plus feet. That's not exactly precise, given I don't know the exact location of the thermal subject, but even moving our measuring tool around, it stays consistently within 1000 to 1200 feet on the hill. The object does appear closer to the top of the hill and tree line in the video. That distance is around the size of a cruise ship, which average around a thousand feet long. That's also roughly a little more than three football field lengths, which are 300 feet long apiece. So that is a considerable distance. Here is a representation of where I would have been standing when I filmed the subject and the direction I was filming in. Looking at this wide angle shot taken from the hood of the car earlier in the day, this would have been about a foot to the right of where I stood outside of the driver's side door. Using this visual, I've attempted to roughly line up where on the hill the thermal would have been by using trees and things in the background. Of course, it's not going to be an exact match, especially with shaky handheld footage that was moving around, but it gives me a rough idea of where it might have been. Now the obvious question is what known animal could this be? In this part of central Kentucky, white-tailed deer are the largest animals in the area for the most part. There are no documented elk here, and even sightings of black bears are extremely rare. Jeff, for example, has never seen one or found sign in this area, but of course I can't exclude that because animals don't follow our rules and can show up where they want. I have doubts that a hog, coyote, or dog would show up that large as a heat signature from over a thousand feet away. Thus, white-tailed deer seems to be overall the most apt comparison. The night before I captured footage of what appeared to be an average sized white-tailed doe at the edge of the field in front of me. The corner of that field where the deer was standing is about 415 feet away from where I was. That's less than half the distance to the subject on the hill. When looking at the two thermals overlaid, the subject on the hill is only slightly smaller than the deer at over half that distance. It does appear bulkier than the deer as well. I find that interesting, albeit inconclusive. So there you have it. Hopefully at some point I can get back to that spot and recreate the footage as it has left me with more questions than answers. So on March 26th, 2022, I got a call from my buddies Evan and Brian about an interesting trackway they had discovered in a location where Evan had actually seen a Sasquatch in 2018. That's crazy. Oh, Chewy, come on. I don't know, I was just looking at that too. Come on, up. I think he just stepped right in the middle oh, of it. Shit. Get up. That's toes. Yeah, luck we got a trackway. Come on. Get across the road. Wow, oh, dude. On. Dude. 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 Are you kidding me? Dude, there's broken branches going through here. Do you want to go? Do you want to take a little 
Do you want to go in there? Is that a dude? <laughs> dude, what are the odds? Look at that. Look at that. We need a, we need a call out. I guess I'll just try toe impressions. I guess I'll just try it out. That thing was heavy. And I'm a size 14 foot. And it's just not even. So with that said, I raced out the door to help them cast it. We were parked down there. Right yeah. There. So this is how I know where my spot is because the plow truck hit. This, oh, it hit the tree. And right I here, completely right. forgot that this whole trail is here. Okay. Now, while we were walking over here, he, yeah. I was like, look out, dude. There it is. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Those. Now, is. wait till you see the other one. But look at the, <laughs> look yeah. that. And then you have this over here. I mean, straight. Now, yeah. I told him to look on the other side of the road. And we both went, he went this way, I went this way. And he was like, dude. Oh, wow. Look at that. That's interesting. I mean, look at and the, careful, the look at the, right ah, that's really weird. You know what I mean? And we put Lee, we were covering it over the camp. We were so freaking out. We didn't want anyone coming or even noticing anything. So we put a couple leaves over it, of course. Yeah, right, right. You put these in here? Yeah. What if I just grab them? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, grab them out. We, we didn't know what, we didn't want to touch this over here, yeah, but this with one. the leaves on top. Yeah. We wanted other witnesses here. Yeah, for sure. It's a very weird shape. Yeah, look at that. That's, it's, it's strange, man. It really is. Yeah. Like, what and the you wind? didn't find anything going up that way? I went yeah. up that. I went in there about 50 yards. Was yeah. I was looking at that. I yeah. just took leaves off to see right. what that was. Right, right. Yeah, you want to just point out what you what you, what you you think you're seeing here? Uh, potential uh, footprint. Not really too sure if it's, you know, Sasquatch, but... But uh, this happens to be in a it. location where I had, had an encounter. I had my encounter right there. That's where I was standing there. So there's, they found... So basically the area we're in, I mean, you got a pond down here. They've got the track here, and the other ones are on the other side of the road. It literally goes straight line, but that's an interesting one. And then if we come over here, you you can see a pretty deep heel here. Yeah. Almost what looks like toes up here. Something in the middle here. I don't know what that is, but you can see. I mean, there was a piece of wood that was right there. there it almost is like a. Out. A little bit of a toe impression. I, yeah, so that was where the wood was? Yeah, that was a little like piece of a uh, stick. It's a piece of a stick. You don't happen to know where that stick went up. No. <laughs> You've got another kind of impression right here. Yeah, it's, it's tough with the leaf litter. Yeah, it just kind of goes up, going up, goes yeah. up that way, huh? All right, so we've got two tracks here. 25 feet between track one that's visible coming from this area to here. So we're gonna cast all three of these prints. I'm gonna give Cliff Barrickman a call because we are in a little bit of an incline here. So we just kinda wanna make sure we, we do it right in terms of casting. He's had a lot of experience obviously casting. Hello. Hey Cliff, how's it going man? This is Alex. It's all right. Yeah, how you doing, sir? We have a potential track find here in New Hampshire in a line, and we're just, uh, it's a, it's on a little bit of a slope, so I'm just, I've never cast on a slope like this, so I'm just kind of reaching out to see if there's any tips or anything you might be able to, to lend us. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, it depends on the slope and, and the situation, of course, but, sure. um, I've cast on more than a, you know, 45 degree slope before. Okay, yeah, this is yeah. less than 45 for sure. This is like the embankment of a of a on the side of a dirt road. Yeah. Um, well, you can try to build a dam. Okay. Um, that works. I got uh, paper uh, bags in the back. But then you're already out in the field right now, I assume, right? Yeah, we. I mean, we have we got paper bags. Probably got some plastic stuff. I got a bunch of you know, survival stuff in the back of my car, so I'm sure we could probably makeshift uh, something. We like 20 pounds probably when you walk out of there. Sure, sure. Uh, We've got a bag, a big bag of uh, Paris. And all right, so we're gonna start the process here. The print is here. We're gonna cast this one first. I'm gonna just get this stick out of the way. Yeah. We're gonna leave all the litter and stuff in the way. There's leaf litter.
Okay, so we're all set. We're all, all done with the casts. We've got obviously one here. This is the one that came up from, I guess, down that way. Right here. Right through here. Yep. Comes here and then straight line across to going up over the stone wall. This one is the interesting one that had the possible uh, toe. So we're really hoping we got some toe marks in there because it had four toe prints kind of right in there. We've got this one, which is a little bit of more of like a slide. Wasn't that great, but uh, we still decided to cast it. I guess it would have gone up there. All right, so yeah. So again, it's kind of hard to tell, but I mean, you've got one, two, three. I don't know what's going on here, but possibly that digit. I think once we get a little more cleaned up, it'll yeah. be a little bit easier to tell, but I mean, it, it is, it's strange. Cause look, if, if that is, if these are toes, you got one, two, three, four, it's coming out like this. So this would have been a left. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. the way it, left, that's the way it right. looked. Yeah. It looked like that was, <clears> that bigger, was the bigger, the, that was the bigger toe. We want to call it that. Yeah. <clears throat> that's what, that's the impression I got before oh, yeah, even casting sure. it. I mean, if you want to just hold this like, just like that. I'm just gonna pour a little bit of water. So tilt this part down a bit, this part down. Yeah, I'm just gonna pour like a little bit on here. I'm just gonna pour it on most of that. Yeah. If you don't mind getting your hand wet. No. Dude, so look at that. Yeah, I mean, wow, you, you got, you did. Like, we we got, got it. some possible ah. digits, something on there. All right, there we go. So we've got the three tracks that we're able to get, I guess from worst to best yeah. in order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is the second one that was up on that hill. I mean, there's just not a lot here. Obviously it's not very cleaned up. We just basically just put water on it. This was that uh, one that was the first actually one. right over here to the first side. Find, yep. First find, I mean, not a lot going on here. It's very hard to tell. As is the case, I mean, the substrate around here in New England is just not great. Really I mean, this is what you're looking at, you know, so. But that being said, this one is interesting. We've got a pretty good shape on it. And obviously we have, I mean, very interesting looking digits here that came out pretty clearly. Obviously this one, we managed to capture whatever's going on here. If those are digits or not. They seem that way in the actual ground. So we've got this angle now. You can see a little bit here, these lines, that's probably the way it was cast. Of course, we casted it, we started running out towards the top, but we managed to capture everything that was in here. So most of the track, I mean, you've got a general shape so if we assume that's a digit there, and this would be the back, we get to about 13, a little over 13 inches. Now looking at it from this way, about five or six inches wide, about five. One of my favorite expeditions so far is the time we spent at Bluff Creek in Northern California in the summer of 2021. With it being such a historic place for many reasons, we spent just under a week in the area and experienced a strange series of events that began as we drove into the area. While driving into Laos camp, we had an interesting incident occur while clearing boulders. All these rocks are presenting a difficulty, a challenge. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> oh my god. Did you hear that? Hear what? It's like rolling down the yeah, hill though. A creek oh, dude. Down there. I thought I heard like a rah. I didn't hear nothing. I wanna throw one. Oh, 
Holy f Holy f Got rocks sliding down the hill here. This is nuts. Is that a bear? Dude, I saw ice shine up there, I thought. Dude, I heard something moving up there. Rocks came sliding down. Who's got a bright flashlight? The first one, the bright one. Okay, I was looking up right here and I thought I saw like two eyes. But something was on that ridge. I mean, rock slides happen. But dude, but that, that was, was crazy. like crazy. That was like perfect timing. That was not uh, accidental. Holy crap. Something moving down there. I heard that. So we've been throwing rocks off like, the side of the road. Like and then I start, I moved forward and I start seeing rocks coming off the hill. It's still rolling down there. And I see a rock, maybe this size, coming at me. And I jumped out of the way. This thing would have hit me in the leg. Saw a couple of them coming. And they were coming right in front of the car. Yeah. And then Tate thinks that he's seeing eye shine up there. Well, you heard something up there before the rocks I fell. thought I heard something when I got out of the car. I thought I heard movement up there. I didn't say anything. Because then I'm hearing you throwing rocks in the side. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking... And we're hearing movement, something down in this area over so, here. Okay, like, so up this way is where Jerry Crew cast the first tracks and where those logging wires were thrown into the creek with the oil drums. Wow. That's just right up the road. And then Laos Camp is right there. And we were talking to Bobo today, and he was saying that he's had two sightings in Laos yeah. Camp. And I've heard things there. And that... I mean, there's something moving down in there for sure. There's something up there for sure, too. Dude, it's so weird, man. I almost... I want to say it's a bear, but why would it go, why would it watch us like that? I mean, I'm not going to say what it was. It's totally possible that those rocks coincidentally came flying down here, but also the fact not that they didn't hit our, the car, which I thought they were going to hit your car for sure. Yes. Yeah, and, and we're talking like pretty big rocks. I, I saw, like they were big enough that all of us freaked out and ran out of the way. I definitely saw eye shine there, something illuminating. So we made it to the spot where uh, this is kind of a rock slide area. And this is where we, where we were last night when we got that rock slide that happened. Here, we'll do a recreation. Here's a rock, I'm gonna toss it down. You can even see it hit the water. So that's what we were doing. We were clearing them here. And then in front of Tate's car, from I, I right up in that little, notch that's this this gully yeah there's like a gully that's where the rocks travel through we got to get the drone up there because i heard movement up I on that too. side and you saw what you thought was eye shine so i'd say we get some drones up in there so there's the road where that what we the rock slide happened last night. I think we should get up to that spot and then let's see what it's like on the on that little clearing there. I agree. Because I mean I don't see any big big rocks up there. So what if something was there and it just happened to push over some rocks? I mean what if a I suppose a bear could do that. I guess we when we get up there we'll have a lot more information from down. Let's down do it. Here. Let's go. I'm gonna just slide this whole little pile down. Yeah, that's that's like there was rocks like that coming down. <laughs> Holy! <f> <laughs> <laughs> you can't see anything though. I'm gonna rule out human because there was nobody here. There's nobody else here. There's nobody else here. Um. I find it hard to believe too. Maybe here's what your maybe is. It probably here, it rolled from right there. Could be something like this though, like that's that. Yeah, that that's approximately the the amount of rocks that came down. The road is right there. Something could stand right here, duck out of cover. You could see us coming for miles. From here. Oh yeah, because the road's right over there. Later that week, while being shown the area where the footprints that coined the term Bigfoot originated in the 1950s, we had happen what I now call the Laos Camp Whoop Incident. 
started with Ron Reed's dog Bandit acting very unusual. After being shown the area, we had an unusual incident happen with Bandit. So what's wanna, going on? You wanna go up, huh? yeah, he's afraid. No, you want to go that way? I mean, he's not that afraid if he wants right, to Bandit? keep going back. His tail's between his legs. He doesn't do that a lot. He's scared. Yeah. Yeah. We heard noises. Did you say so he's scared of like gunshots, fireworks, loud bangs. That's about it. Dude, I thought you guys were hitting my, my purple knocker thing. That's yeah. how loud it was. No. So what happened was we stopped there. He went all the way up there and stood in the road and, and we commented, oh, look, a wolf. Ha ha. Oh, it's like, oh my God, there's a, there's a wolf. <laughs> then he disappeared. He and then you came up way. and we, yeah. we thought so, he was back there. So if we're on a trail and he doesn't know like to get back in the house or if he doesn't have a safe place to go to, he will, he will duck to the side of the trail and hide. That sounds exactly like what he did. But yeah. we're here. But that's like that's because I mean, of like a loud bang. If he heard a loud bang or something, then that's what would have done it. But dude, like wood knocks thought, aren't like we loud thought that that was we like thought that. that was you guys for sure. Everybody turned. Jamie turned. No. Dustin well, yeah, turned. Everyone like everybody like a... turned and looked over there. No, so if that wasn't anything. Tate or anybody, mm -hmm. that but was then some what of the... we heard wasn't that loud. Yeah, we heard something else over, over here. here that was also like like loud. Like it was like pop, and then like maybe what ten seconds later, talk again, same spot. And then it was shortly after we heard down here. And, that and we thought that was you guys. Heard. There are no wood knocks or anything. It would be, be up on elevation probably unless it was over the back there somewhere. No, it was like right in line. I stopped immediately. You all right, buddy? Bandit. <whistles> here, buddy. You okay, man? So he's fine now. Bring it to Ron as soon as they got to the bridge. He, uh, he wasn't scared anymore. Is that Ken? But who did the whoop just now? I didn't hear yeah, no you didn't hear a whoop? Come here, buddy. I, I didn't. I was the only one in the vicinity who had heard a whoop-like vocalization while checking on Bandit. I inquired around camp if anybody else had heard or done such a vocalization, and nobody seemed to have heard anything or done any whoops. It was odd, but hard to say exactly what it was at the time. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. I later shared the audio with Chris Spencer of the Olympic Project, who analyzed the sound further. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. 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 Later that night, we deployed to an area called Laird Meadow, and again had some rather peculiar things happen. Laird Meadow has a history of alleged Bigfoot tracks being found there in years past, so we decided to try our luck with some nighttime investigating. All right, so we're going to Laird Meadow. I want to have uh, groups of two spread out through Laird Meadow. I want each group to have a walkie and a therm. Response. 
We spent a couple of hours in the area and heard various wood knocks while doing knocks back and forth between the two teams in the meadow, with the third team further away unable to hear much of what had happened. We had like a brat. We had a branch come down right behind me, right in the tree line. And then the knocks that we heard were coming from that direction. Yeah, roughly that direction. That's what I heard. That's where we came in. A loud knock from our radio communication with you, but we didn't have radio communication with them. So every time they talked, it was just static. It was just static. We didn't hear it. But you guys didn't hear the first sound that you heard of the night. What was that? Sticks breaking. You know. One could say that given Bluff Creek is one of the most notable places within the Bigfoot topic, that we simply had Bigfoot on the brain, so to speak, and given the incidents were not substantiated any further, it was all just a coincidence. Perhaps that is the case, or perhaps it was something intriguing. I suppose we'll never know, which is the frustrating part. By far, one of the most fascinating cases I've ever had the chance to investigate would be so-called codename Area A on Alaska's Kenai Peninsula. If you haven't seen parts 1 and 2 of the Alaskan Coastal Sasquatch films, go check them out, as they delve into this case in a very detailed manner. The natural beauty and wildlife alone in this area make it incredible, but it's the history of strange activity that truly fascinates me. And I saw the, probably the last between 15 and 25 feet of flight of a rock that was, it was the size of a football. That's when we heard of my first whoop. I'm like, dude, there's a rock right here, you know? It just came from above. It's only one women out here. It's never, we've, we haven't heard it. It's only one women out here. Located over an hour boat ride from the nearest port, this location is extremely desolate. Nestled between dramatic mountains wherever you look, this area is that classic coastal temperate rainforest habitat that comprises much of the coastline stretching thousands of miles from Alaska to the Pacific Northwest. We had quite a few intriguing occurrences while out at Area A for a week last year. Our approach that night was simple, sitting around the fire and conversing and playing it cool. Everything was seemingly normal as we joked around and chatted on, until suddenly it wasn't. You have a smoke? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You hear that? Okay, okay. That's a good, are we, are we that was the best I've heard. Okay, so we were kind of talking, goofing off, and we started, and I thought I heard a knock. That's the sound of rocks. Yeah. Something clunk, clunk. fell into the water, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had like branches. And then smashed. the branches, and then yeah. more rocks. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best I've heard in in like two summers. Just roll on that guy. Eli. Last time they they were, they threw like fifteen rocks. We attempted to recreate the sound of the rocks being thrown into the water we had been hearing. Yep. 
Before departing for the cabin, we left an audio recorder present at the upper fire pit, as well as a small trail camera hidden on the inside of a rotting tree. So as I was just standing out here, it's a little bit foggy and rainy, and I was just getting some B-roll of the mountains, and I happened to be focusing on something in the bay when I heard what I thought was a gunshot, very loud. One of the guys in the cabin apparently heard it when I was coming back in go twice, heard that same noise. There shouldn't be anybody shooting out here. Uh, that's the kind of sound that... Uh, this guy said that he heard the other day as well when we were getting onto the uh, the raft when we were coming back from that side. As soon as we got on the beach, very strange. I don't know. I mean, there shouldn't be anyone shooting up here. There's nobody else out here, so it's just kind of strange. My first thought when I heard that was gunshot, and that's what the other guy thought as well. So, just more weirdness out here. While going out to switch the battery on an audio recorder behind the cabin itself, by pure chance I happened to look at the back side of the cabin closest to the bunk room and noticed something rather intriguing that we all proceeded to examine. You can really see it. If you, if you come down here, come here. You oh that? yeah. You see that? Here you go. Look yeah, wow. Oh, that's the money shot. Zoom in on that. But yeah, you can see the... So zoom out. Or do you keep it like that? How's that? Yeah, you can see it's about eight. This would have to be like the configuration or something like that. But this, but again, what's so weird is back, back of this person's palm here is touching here, as we can see right here, right? So that's where that's the back of it. If I'm touching the back, look where my hand falls flat. Yeah, your bottom teeth. Your bo and look at their digits, their, their, their ring and uh, middle finger almost go to here. That's nuts. Who's got a bigger hand? We pretty much are all pretty much the same here. And it's the only one. It's right under that window. I know. But it's like a really sticky, sweaty palm. Yeah. One, two, three, four. So, so it's why about, is it out of thumb? about uh, that tip to that bottom, six inches across. I mean, that is within human range, but yeah, that's if I'm fully extending it, my fingers out. And that's out. what I'm saying. It's like they're straight. They're not, you yeah, know what I mean? It's not, not like you doing, it's not like you doing this real steep angle. Because yep. yeah, these two fingers are real close together. And this one, this, this pinky, if that's a pinky, that's the same length as the pointer finger, which I guess makes sense. But, I don't know. It's a, pretty, it's a decently big hand. None of the guys could recall pressing against this spot with their hand, and we have no idea how long this could have been there for. What was interesting about this handprint was that it was definitely made by a hand. While that certainly doesn't rule out human, it does rule out bear, or moose, or anything that isn't human-like. Without the proper equipment to collect a sample, we would arrange for somebody with a law enforcement background to lift the print in the coming weeks. It was found, I believe, last week, a couple weeks ago. I don't have the date it was found. I like these with the little caps on. It's there, it's just not very visible. And we're 
at a disadvantage because it's on an uneven surface. Two and three. These are the fingers, supposed to be the fingers, and that's supposed to be the board. All right. I think uh, we've done as much damage as we can do with this. The samples were sent to Doug Hycheck of Monster Quest fame for future analysis. I emailed a few folks about the handprint, including Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who believed it was likely a human print. I also emailed two professors of primate dermatoglyphics, who wished to remain anonymous. One agreed with Dr. Meldrum's analysis that a human was likely the culprit, while the other initially believed it was some sort of bear, but upon closer inspection agreed it was human or ape in pattern. Albeit inconclusive overall, I believe this was a great exercise in following up with alleged evidence with outside parties for their professional opinions. The samples are currently awaiting testing as part of Doug Hycheck's Legend Meets Science 2, so we hope to learn more in the near future about them. With Area A being such a promising location, it was no secret that I'd planned to return again. This is exactly where I will be headed this summer for an ambitious expedition. I will be spending two full weeks at Area A, something that has never been done before. The previous longest trip ever out to the site was during our eight days out there last year. I will be trying out various experiments with other researchers and documenting daily occurrences. This will all be covered in its own series called Dark Coast, Hunt for the Alaskan Bigfoot, which will begin releasing later this summer and into the fall. It will be similar to Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, but perhaps more in the form of a video journal type series. I'm very excited for this endeavor, and we hope to continue where the Alaskan coastal Sasquatch left off. So there you have it. Just some of the more interesting things we've had occur while out in the field across North America. Stay tuned for more coming in terms of the Bigfoot Beyond the Trail series, as well as others coming to the Small Town Monsters channel.